don't understand what they want from me They take my hands, washing them in dirty water Try to find what's right in a distant place Silence fills my heart with empty space But now I'm sure of where I'll go from here And tensions rise They push me to divert my vision
It's Sunday night, and we are popping the bubble on satellites tonight. How are you doing, brother? That's excellent. It's uh, great to be here. I'm looking forward to tonight's podcast. Yeah, it should be fun. We've got uh, some great information that we're going to be sharing about pressure. Who thought pressure could be so special? But it's actually a very important feature in our environment, and um, it, it actually affects the way we live, the things that we can do quite a bit. So tonight we're going to be going through some information on pressure that... So there's been a, a question asked to satellites, right? How do they work? And we're going to be answering that tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, it goes like this. There are two ways that we can sustain travel up in the air. One, fans and propellers that create thrust in the air can ascend vertically and when used with the wings can keep themselves afloat using lift. Two, lighter than air vehicles that use either helium or hydrogen to lift a payload. Both of these have their limitations, and those limitations preclude the possibility of, quote, satellites existing. Pressure is a real measurable force, and flying vehicles actually must be built to withstand the pressure changes it will experience during different flights and different altitudes. In this hangout, we are going to make sure everyone understands exactly what pressure is and how it precludes the existence of, quote, satellites. Excellently written, Jason. Why don't you <laughs> fill us in a little bit more on your description box? Yeah, well... So let's let's go ahead and brainstorm before we get into this. And for everybody here, think about the ways that you can sustain being up in the air. All right? How can you be up in the air for a long period of time? And uh, so in the description box, there's there's the two main ones. I can think of another way, but it's not really feasible for the things that we want to do. So the you've got the lighter than air vehicle where it's either got helium or hydrogen and it's it's helping lift the vehicle off the ground. Um, then you've got propeller or uh, fan driven things where it actually has thrust. Some of them have wings and that lift help keeps it afloat. Um, the only other one I can think of is magnetism where we could actually suspend something up in the air, but there's a limit as to how far away from the ground you can do such a thing. You can't use a magnet and hold something up, you know, 10 miles in the air or 50 miles in the air. So that's no. only low, low in the air type stuff. So if there's only these two ways that we can actually go up and sustain being in the air, what we're going to do is go through and look at what the limitations are. What are our practical engineering issues that we're up against? Um, how far can we have pressurized cabins? From that point on, you know, what altitude are we? What are the records? And I think we're going to really be able to narrow down, um, narrow it down to just within under 200,000 feet, really. That uh, That's our maximum height. Mm -hmm, that's it. Mm -hmm. Especially for yeah. humans. Especially for humans. So you might be able to launch something that gets up above that altitude for a little bit longer, but you're not going to put a person in it. And you'll be seeing the reason why tonight. Yeah. Well, I hope that people are able to glean some truth and some information as to what we're, we're trying to discuss tonight. So basically, Jason is showing, and we're going to be going through links, uh, dealing with different pressures and how high we can actually go, and the types of suits and the different types of systems that we actually need to go above certain altitudes. And it basically blows out of the door any, any possibility that we're supposedly going to, you know, space or, or anything like that. And uh, also it, it debunks the idea that satellites could work because our satellites, one of the two ways that we were able to sustain travel up in the air as written in the description box. No, they're heavy objects. Uh, Jason said one has to be either lighter or air or the other one's going to have to have a fan propeller to create thrust. Do we see any fans or propellers on any satellites ever? Well, we're, we're going to look at the no. rockets. We're going to look at the rockets. So there's a different class, but I talked about being able to have sustained elevation. So a rocket... It burns, and on, once it's burned out, there's nothing to hold it up anymore. It's not lighter than yeah. air, and it doesn't nope. have fans or propellers to help keep it up. So once once the engine's burned out, it's, it's coming back down. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, those are all great topics, and, and also how far satellites would be able to even take a picture of anything if they did have cameras on them. There were a bunch of other things that uh, we hope that people are able to understand we're not going to make it too complicated. So um, 
you know, I'm looking forward to it. I'm glad everyone showed up. Thank you guys for tuning in. Hopefully everything is, is nice and clear and the sound is good and uh, you're able to hear us and, and everything's working correctly. We're we're really working hard on this team to try to improve the quality of our streams and bring out truth with good music. Uh, and we're trying to keep the music sort of topic centric tonight. We've got uh, songs dealing with the topics, pressure, uh, low pressure and satellites. Um, so there'll be three song breaks. So yeah, Jason, I don't know when it is that you want to take it away to screen share, but I'm looking forward to learning tonight. I hope everybody has their learning cap on. I just hit the like button. If you guys want to help share the information and truth that we share, hit the like button, like, like button and share this with anybody that you know that might be looking for truth. Well, be, before we get into the fun stuff, why don't you tell people what they can be looking forward to this Friday? Oh, we're having a conversation with, uh, uh, T jump and one of his heliocentric friends and that's going to be at what time 12 o'clock mm -hmm. yeah so we're going to have to uh prepare in the in the work day schedule so that we can have this so uh make sure that you guys tune in we'll have a rise and grind friday morning and then after that i believe it's at 12 p.m central that's 1 p.m eastern i don't know the exact date today is San sunday january 8th but we'll be doing the uh jason's going to be able to screen share this time with T-Jump, and T-Jump's brought in a heliocentric expert for the debate. <laughs> Not an expert. Is it, is it a... Mr. Sensible. <laughs> Which, um, yeah, we'll see how sensible he is. Uh, I've, I've peeked at a couple of his videos, and I, I'm not, um, I'm not going to get my hopes up too high. So, no. <laughs> so what we're going to do is, um, we're going to have that opportunity to go through the footage that when I talked to T-Jump and I said, hey, I've got this footage, um, but I couldn't screen share it. Now we're going to have that opportunity. So it should be uh, right. it should be great. Uh, I've got some new tools, uh, filters, filters for analyzing stuff that I think might blow the doors off of a few people. And <sighs> um, it's easy. It's accessible to everybody. So. We keep on recommending, if you don't believe these clouds behind the sun footages, stuff like that, go get yourself a P900, go get yourself a P1000. Um, there's even some cameras, some Sonys that have, you know, 50x zoom that'll still show you what we're talking about. So um, the technology is out there, it's available, and we're going to show you how to actually see and recognize what it is that you're observing don't let anybody tell you that, uh, oh, the clouds are too bright or whatever. Or yeah. The sun's glaring through the clouds. We're going to show you a bunch of ways that um, we can debunk that as being the case. Well, and again, what we're trying to do is inspire other people to go out and do their own testing. Anything that we share and talk about, you can go and verify yourself. We're not going to be bringing you to a whiteboard asking you to imagine uh, any of these things like gravity and all these different Cavendish experiments, we actually show physical, reliable, repeatable, testable observations. Because that's how we base our realm view. And that's what we're going to show. I can't wait. It's going to be fun. I'll have some memes prepared. But the majority of the podcast is going to be Jason going through the footage and evidence in the clips from his videos that he wasn't able to go through due to um, T-Jump's horrible quality, whatever system that he's running. He, he really was using up. Restream, and it's just very bare bones. It... Yeah, it's not. That's. <clears throat> Anyways, we're going to do it much better. It won't have any music. It won't have anything like that because... Uh, they have to monetize their end. So we don't, we don't have monetization problems here on these channels. We can do everything that we want, any song, any video we're allowed. So uh, I'm looking forward to it, bro. So do you want, did you want to get into the screen share and take it away? Sure. Let's jump into it. In fact, boom, we're there. So right. just going to get my mic in a little bit better position. So we are going to be talking about high altitude balloons. We're going to be talking about rockets and um, we're going to be talking about how high we can actually go. These, these are the ways that we can preclude the existence of satellites or space travel. And um, so we're going to be doing a little bit of reading in Wikipedia, picking up some of some of the so-called facts. And we'll be pointing out where there's obvious misdirection and psyops taking place. And then we're going to be pointing to what is reasonable based off of the different, um, different things that we can test and, and research out. So let's go ahead and start with high altitude balloons. We're going to do some reading here. 
They are crude or uncrewed balloons, usually filled with helium or hydrogen. Well, I'm going to say it's either helium or hydrogen because these are the only two things that um, are lighter than air. So it's going to be helium or hydrogen, one or the other, that are released into the stratosphere, generally attaining between 18 and 37, which is 11 and 23 miles, or 59,000 and 121,000 feet above sea level. In 2002, a balloon named BU-60-1 reached a record altitude of 173,900 feet. All right, so this right here is what Wikipedia is listing as the highest altitude that a balloon's ever gone. All right, so this is a lighter than air vehicle and um, it doesn't need engines, right? It just works off the basis that the helium and hydrogen will lift and it, it'll lift a certain payload so you can see in a picture like this they don't fill the balloon all the way in fact they just put just enough helium or hydrogen into the balloon to be able to pick up the payload because we're going to be learning that what happens is, is you as you go up in altitude the pressure is going to decrease thus the gas inside the balloon is going to expand and eventually we're going to get to a rupture point so okay, let's, let's slowly dial this back in here. You, you went through that pretty quick. Yeah. We're talking about the altitude at which the expanding lighter than air material will then explode. And I do not have a screen share. I can watch it on the live feed, but when you go to a music break, I'm not going to be able to hear it. Um, but it's excellent. I see the screen. It's nice and projected. So go back into your topic, please. Uh, the most common type of high altitude balloons is weather balloons. Other purposes include use as a platform for experiments in the upper atmosphere. Modern balloons generally contain electronic equipment such as radio transmitters, cameras, satellite navigation systems such as GPS receivers. These balloons are launched into what is termed near space, defined as the area of Earth's atmosphere between the Armstrong limit, which is 11 to 12 miles above sea level, where pressure falls to the point that a human being cannot survive without a pressurized suit. So, I mean, this is... That's in, that's a very interesting fact. We're going to take the background music down one-eighth okay. of an inch. And uh, I just wanted to reiterate that. So we're going to learn later on tonight that uh, to go up into these higher altitudes, you actually have to have a pressurized spacesuit. And the funny thing is I've never seen NASA actually use these with the astronauts. No, know, maybe they have a pressurized cabin system that does it. But we know that now that to go into these high altitudes in the 65 year old planes that they still use, if you believe it, um, they actually have suits that are pressured, pushing back against the body so that you're able to keep the same because the blood wants to run. It's it's similar to the bends, but continue. I, I think you've got it dialed in. It might be. Uh, I'm going to check now. And keep your eye on the chat, too, if you can. So. Due to the low cost of GPS and communications equipment, high altitude ballooning is a popular hobby. I don't know if a lot of people do it, but um, take a look at the type of pictures that you can get from a high altitude balloon. Now, some might think that there is curvature here. We're going to be showing how most common cameras like a GoPro have a wide angle lens. And so if the camera is tipped down, you'll see it... Um, You'll see a bend like this, and then if the camera is tipped up, you'll see that line arcing the other direction. So um, none of the possible curvature that you see here, if, if it curls up the other way, it just has to do with the lens of the camera. Now this one might get you, brother. Under history, the first hydrogen balloon, right? When do you think the first hydrogen balloon? Hydrogen seems a much more scary than helium, right? Well, yeah, I guess I, it because right? It's yeah, he, question because I already know. I, yeah, helium, it's it's a uh, inert, right? It doesn't burn, so it seems much it safer. Doesn't either right? It doesn't implode. So here, a French professor of physics, uh, Charles, provided a large quantity of hydrogen, which had only been produced in small quantities pre previously. Remember, this is 1783. So he produced large quantities by mixing 1,100 pounds of iron, right? We got iron, 
it's not hard to get a hold of, and 600 pounds of sulfuric acid. The balloon called Carl Carlier took five days to fill and was launched from Paris, where 300,000 people gathered to watch the spectacle. The balloon was launched and rose through the clouds. The expansion of the gas caused the balloon to tear and it descended 45 minutes later, 12 miles away from Paris. So they, they filled it up with the hydrogen and of course it flew, but so the, the structure of the balloon, it needs to be elastic enough, it needs to be light enough. And um, because it's going to expand, the higher and higher it goes, that gas is going to expand because there's less and less pressure. We're going to be looking at how much pressure there is. Now, keep in mind, this is, this is um, Wikipedia. So we're going to be coming across a whole bunch of propaganda. So crude high altitude balloons, notable crude high altitude balloon flights include three records set for highest skydive. The first by Joseph Kittinger in 1960, uh, followed by Felix Baumgartner in 2012. Um, so what do you have to say about the Felix Baumgartner jump? Well, it was, it was fake. It was, it was, it was done in a green screen. What do they call those? Foam ball pit. Foam ball pits. Right. <laughs> and the way that we first found that out was that the decal actually moved places when they switched cameras. So they didn't have the correct decals in the different, uh, foam pits that they used. So that was fake. It was set up to cause division and arguments amongst the communities because some of the cameras supposedly they were flat, some of the cameras were fish-eyed, they were round, so people were arguing back and forth, but none of it was real. All right, so uses. Let's, let's really contemplate these uses. Uncrewed high-altitude balloons are also useful as research balloons for educational purposes by hobbyists. Common uses include meteorology, atmospheric climate research, collection of imagery for near space, amateur radio applications, submillimeter astronomy. High altitude balloons have been considered for use in telecommunications and space tourism. Private companies uh, such as these here are developing both crude and uncrewed high altitude balloons for scientific research. High altitude platform stations have been proposed for applications such as communication relays. So what is it that a satellite is supposed to be? I guess it's an information relayer. Yeah, a communication relay. So they've considered using high altitude balloon high altitude balloons as communication relays. They're probably doing it, right? That's what they say they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um No, I mean with these balloons, yes. Mhm. Mm so here's a different, you know, here's a kind goes up to about a hundred thousand feet. We're going to take a look at one of these, a uh, video of one of these and let's see, this type of ballooning is called the poor man's space program. So it allows amateurs to design functioning models of spacecraft and launch them into a space like environment. Well, what makes it a space like environment? It's the lack of air. Lack of air. We're going to be showing people it's the lack of air that makes it space-like. And in addition to the tracking equipment and other payload components may include sensors, data loggers, cameras, amateur television, transmitters, or other scientific instruments. Um, carry a simplified payload package called a balloon sat. So we're going to get down here and we're going to see... Here's the balloon sat, their communication array. And it all leads up to geostationary balloon satellite. So the geostationary balloon satellite are proposed high altitude balloons that would float in the mid stratosphere, 60,000 to 70,000 feet. Now this is a range that we are going to be keying in on for a lot of reasons. And, um, this this is around the range that it's the top of what humans can go um all right so at a fixed point over the earth's surface and thereby act as atmosphere analogs to satellites you're saying this would do the same thing as a satellite so instead of 
trying to put something up 250 miles or 22,000 miles away from Earth when they talk about geostationary, you can actually get geostationary right above you at 60 to 70,000 feet. All right. So it says that at that altitude, air density is 1 15th of what it is at sea level. We're going to be going over what the pressure is at sea level and what the pressure is as we go up in altitude. It says the average wind speed at these levels is less than that of the surface. Well, it actually gets to zero. A propulsion system would allow the balloon to move into and maintain its position. The GBS would be powered with solar panels en route to its location and then receive laser power from a cell tower it hovers over. <laughs> what do you think about getting laser power from the ground, brother? <laughs> I have to tell you that it's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. <laughs> The, the nonsense that these supposed scientists come out with. So you're telling me that they shoot a laser beam at this device and it powers it. It charges it. Right? <laughs> yeah, laser. You're telling me? No, lasers are good for something and that is data communication. So. Yes. If, the, if, if lasers were powering it, the solar panel and the sun would be, you know, whatever, 100,000 mm -hmm. times the laser. Mm -hmm. All right. So a GPS can be used to provide broadband internet access over a large area. Uh, isn't that what SpaceX is touted to do? Or yeah, yeah, exactly. Laser broadband would connect, connect the GPS to the network, which could then provide a large area of coverage because of its wider line of sight, they say, over the curvature of the <laughs> Earth. Right? No, no. no. <laughs> a wider line of sight is of sight. could have just stopped right there. And so that's it for um, high altitude balloons. So let's take a look yeah. at what this actually looks like. Um, I just pulled up a video. But it... What's that? Go ahead. Um, so you can, I found this just by doing a quick YouTube search, GoPro weather balloon to space, full uncut footage. This is what I was looking for. And I like the fact that we've got some data yeah, that we can watch here. I, I noticed the data and the, the thermometer on the right side. Yeah, so let's go. Point out. Let's go back down to ground level here. Oh, he's already let go here. And you'll see that uh, down at ground level here, he's at ninety-two degrees Fahrenheit, and. Um, so you're going to be able to see the speed, the altitude, and it's going to attract distance. This is distance down range, it looks like. So let's just jump through here very quickly. Very quickly, we're going to jump up. And within within a thousand feet, we're already going to see. Look at now we're at almost 75 degrees at 4200 feet and so pay attention to what things look like from these different elevations now you see what a boat looks like down on here in the water you see what the size of a house looks like how big a field looks from this that's close how, how high are we now sorry is that 4296 feet that is so it's not it, it is higher than the cn tower by by a lot but i, I mean i've Okay, I'm just getting in my perspective on the sizes of everything here. I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah, well, I think we did start at about a 1,000 feet above sea level. Let's take a peek here. Yeah, we're just over a 1,000 feet above sea level beginning. Because this is in a place in New York. So, I'm jumping ahead here, and we're at 5,600. Okay, now we've already crossed a big threshold here. We're just a couple minutes in. We're at 9,300 feet. Yeah. So I want to go back to 8,000 feet right around here. And this, wow. this is the level. 8,000 feet is the elevation where the FAA um, mandates that plane cabin pressure not exceed. You can't... or you they must maintain at least eight, the pressure of 8,000 feet because we're going to see as we start reading through this information that it this actually affects a human's health once you go above 8,000 feet. 
right? It's, it starts to become dangerous for the human to be above this what? elevation. If we weren't made to go that high up, right? Yeah, but so, you know, still a plane, a plane will go much higher than this, and they're going to do that because of the pressurized cabin. And so we're going to start skipping up here. Where now we're going to be going through the level of the clouds, so you can still he still see that there are clouds above us. Still clouds eye level up here in the thirty thousands. Now it looks like we're starting to to get above the tops of the clouds. But what's happening to our ground? Right here, 38,000 feet. This is the range that commercial air, air flights will fly in between 30 and 40,000 for most of them. Some of the some of the more modern planes will fly between 40 and 44,000. And we'll be seeing Go ahead. So we're we're not able to see very much on the ground. It's becoming despotized, fuzzy, pixel out, pixelated out, right? Just like anything beyond 10 miles. We're starting mm -hmm. to get pixelated out. So don't worry about the, don't worry about what appears to be curvature because sometimes it curves the other way, people. Right? The way the lens acts mm -hmm. goes up and down. You'll get a concave earth and a spherical earth, but we know that it's actually level. But so here it's it's floating around. We've got the sun up, and um, at this point the sun appears to be above the camera. Right camera is still lower than the sun here mm -hmm. and the sun's sun's glow is localized to this area as it spins around you'll see that the other areas are not not as lit up but you're going to see that you don't really there's the ground right here so here's the clearing in the clouds and and now trying to zoom in on something from this altitude you know continue it's going to be a big challenge, right? Well, what I what I wanted to point out here is that uh, it's amazing that so when we are talking about our circle of sight and how far we can actually see, so when you get these high altitude balloons that go up, and then you'll see like you know a, a large portion of Florida in the picture, and people will think because it's a fisheye lens and it's curved like this that you see on the screen that the Earth, your Florida, takes up you know a quarter of northern hemisphere. Right, it, when it, you're only seeing the circle of sight that the altitude of the balloon is allowing you. So it could be 30 miles, it could be 20 miles, and and you're able to see that depending on how high you go. So the the interesting thing is to state that we only see so far. Right there, with the horizon we still have a a vanishing point at this height here, as Jason's got up on the screen. Yeah, so we're up at 56,000 uh, feet right here, where we are well above any pressurized aircraft. Right, we we hit the ceiling of pressurized aircraft in the mid forty thousands. So now now you're talking about little little planes that may have a pressurized cockpit, but the the pilot is definitely in a pressurized spacesuit, and he needs it. So here we're going through the sixty thousand foot range. Notice it. Even in the clear areas here, you really can't even make out the big fields in the ground anymore. Right? And we're at 66,000 feet. Here we are at about 70,000 feet. It's pretty high. You can tell that you see the blackness of the sky above. Yeah, and this, this right here was the big opening in the clear area. You know, you can't yeah. see the ground anymore. Well, one interesting thing to point out, too, is, is it's daytime, right? Mm-hmm. So what do you think that black is? Or why don't we see that black from the ground? It's just something that I want to bring to the subconscious thought. Well, so here's another neat thing. Here we are at 74,000 feet. Let me go back. Watch the... Uh... We'll, we'll get some more examples of this. But you're going to see the, the shadows being cast like to the right. From the sun's here, you'll be seeing the shadows cast this way. And the shadows cast this way. Now, if this was a sun that was 93 million miles away, all the shadows would be cast straight towards us at the camera, right? Yeah, parallel. Mm -hmm. It demands at the heliocentric model. I see the shadows. I see the directions, yes. Let's go up higher. Let's so here we are, 81,000 feet. 
Wow. 86,000 yeah. feet. Look at that. That looks flat, too. It's flat because <laughs> the realm is flat. So here's here's where that bobbing takes place. And you can see that uh, when the camera tilts down, it curves this way. When it tilts up, it, it goes convex. See that? Yeah. So now it actually it looks like we're getting close to being eye level with the sun. Yeah, it's closer. You're right? Mm hmm. Right, we're still going up 90,000 feet. Wow. Now watch that. if this swings around. Way above the clouds. Way above them. So. They, they're saying that they're using spy cameras and stuff on this. Yeah. Look at what, what's beneath you. And then, not only that, they say that the ISS is 250 miles, <laughs> right, above Earth. It's ridiculous. Here we're at 90,000 feet, and there's no chance of you filming anything on the ground below you here. Yeah. Well, and to note, it's also minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes. Really cold. If we're, we're, if, to point out here, just for anybody that's a heliocentrist the closer you get to the sun the hotter it should get right that just logic the sun is a ball of heat getting closer to the sun we're freezing right so this is your clear area here you can't see the ground no you can't make anything out all right we're getting close to the pop right. this is the reason why there's no pictures of earth from space because this is the highest you can get and this is all you can take a picture of do you think you could tell someone that this is a sphere earth from this shot no you can't right it's impossible impossible all right so we're getting real close to the pop take a look at you know the peaks on some of these clouds look at the way the shadows yeah everything shadowed to the sun Will we swing around before it pops? Let's try skipping a few. 97, 93, 97.4. Almost to 100,000. It's too bad they couldn't. They needed a bigger balloon to get to a... Uh, All right. So you can clearly see that the shadows are back this direction. And then over here, the shadows are back this direction. The shadows yeah, are pointing to right. the sun right here. Mm -hmm. It's just illuminating this area right here. Mm -hmm. well, what's 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 in the dark areas? <laughs> My question for you. There's what's no there? there's no stars up here. There's no it's daytime. It's daytime. How are you going to see the stars? Okay, but where is the light? Why is it blackness? Okay. I want people to think about that in their subconscious minds. Where's the pop? It's black. Oh, there we go. 97.8. So here we go. Boom. You see the... Yep. Sorry to burst your bubble on your satellite. <laughs> <laughs> we did. But that's what happened. So <clears throat> the, the container, the balloon, expanded to its physical limits and then ruptured. And that is, that is the doom of a high-altitude balloon. That is what it's slated for. And then it takes its trip back down. And um, so that's how far, how high we can go. Remember back in the Wikipedia. The balloon, that's how far we can send a balloon. They said the record was 173,900 feet. Yeah, we got to see the footage from that. Mm -hmm. That footage. All right, so let's do a little bit of study on atmospheric pressure now. And um, so this is related to what we call air, right? And air is what we need to breathe, to live. And uh, so atmospheric pressure, known as barometric pressure, is the pressure within the atmosphere of Earth. So it comes down to a measurement of 14.696 PSI. We'll just round that off to 14.7 PSI. And that is the pressure on everything at sea level. All right, so if you've got a can of soda, 
The reason why the can of soda isn't exploding is because the amount of pressure there is around it keeping it from exploding. And now if you go up in the atmosphere, if you go higher and higher and the pressure goes down, there'll be less and less pressure against the outside of the can and it will eventually pop. Um, so we'll skip through some of that. You don't want to learn about hydrostatic pressure. <laughs> I love all this stuff. I'm a, I'm a data geek. Yeah. So did you know that the altimeter in an airplane, mm -hmm. it tells you how high you are off the ground based on the pressure pressure yes i do know that because to go to the salt flats in bolivia is the best place in the realm to measure your altimeter because the salt flats are so flat that you can check your altimeter on the original start point anywhere else on the flat it'll still be the exact same pressure and then you can go other places in the realm and compare it to the bolivian salt flats so the salt flats will be at their altitude and their correct uh, pressure due to its height Right? And that's a high, it's way above sea level, the Bolivian salt flat. So I, I have studied a bit into this and uh, I think that's interesting. So the pressure barometer tells them their elevation above mm. sea level. Yeah. They don't have, they don't have a measuring rod that they stick down below the plane and see how far they have to extend the rod. Laser, they don't laser yeah. it down and the time that this, the bounce of the light comes back to it. They don't drop a rope out and measure how many knots they can pull back up. Right? No, it's done here by your barom barometric pressure altimeter. Exactly. Um, surface pressure. So basically what I want to interject here is I believe that the air is almost like a type of a liquid that we can't see and there's a weight to it and the weight here pushes down, right? Just like water does, but it's the air that, that's doing that and it's filled with oxygen and nitrogen and we breathe it in and everything lives and survives off of it, right? All right. So these practical things will help a person understand. So this plastic bottle was sealed at 14,000 feet altitude and was crushed by the increase in atmospheric pressure recorded at 9,000 feet and 1,000 feet as was brought down towards sea level. So seal it at 14,000, at 9,000 feet it's been crushed this much, and then back down at 1,000 feet it's been crushed this much. So, so if people think that they're going in uh, submarines underwater, unfortunately this here diagram does away with that idea, or high in the altitude, both. Mm hmm was well, the whole submarine thing is is the um it's the antithesis argument to what we're going through right now with satellites but uh, yeah we can show that submarines as they talk about are not real as well um so they they record the pressure within storms so this is one of the things that you hear about with this storm had a this barometric pressure this storm had this barometric pressure and so the pressure on earth is constantly varying. When you see the map with the H and the L, as far as the weather patterns are concerned, one is higher pressure and one is lower pressure. And that right there is one of the debunks of the Freemason New World Order pressurized pizza dome, right? Because they say that they're inside a container that's pressurized. And that's the reason why there's pressure. But if it, you're inside a pressurized container, you can't have variations of pressure within the container. Can't. So this is one of the great simulation proofs. Now, this is neat. The Dead Sea. It's the lowest place on Earth because it's 1,410 feet below sea level. So it actually has a higher pressure than sea level. So the lower you go, the more pressure there is. Now, the thing is, sea level limits how far we can go in most places. Now, but if you were to, that eight mile deep hole that they dug in Russia, they were trying to see how far deep they could go. The atmospheric pressure would be the most intense, that eight miles down in that hole. Um, so the boiling point of liquids. Here's one. I just got to cover it because this is one of the ultimate cheats when it comes to uh, the whole free energy topic. 
So it says pure water boils at 212 Fahrenheit at Earth's standard atmospheric pressure. Um, because of this, the boiling point of liquids is lower at lower pressure and higher at higher pressure. So cooking at high elevations therefore requires adjustments to recipes mm -hmm. or pressure cooking. So yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, I'll cut you off. Excuse me. The, the thing is, all right, if you're going to run a steam turbine, right, the steam you're going to use to run a turbine, that's going to be your power generator at regular sea level pressure. It, 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 ha it takes a higher temperature in order to boil the water. So what they're saying here is conversely, if one wishes to evaporate a liquid at lower temperature, for example, in distillation, the atmospheric pressure may be lowered by using a vacuum pump. Hmm. So all you have to do is, is put the water under a vacuum and now all of a sudden it'll boil at a much lower temperature. Thus you don't have to use as much fuel heat to, to boil the water, right? Yeah, yeah. I've got another thing to point out too when you're done this time. Yeah, please. We change topics. Well, what I wanted to quickly point out was uh, doing drag racing for most of my life. I grew up as a, an enthusiastic drag racer. I loved it a lot. So I, I got used to understanding that we had to check the humidity, the temperature, and the barometric pressure when we were racing. And the reason why is because humidity, barometric pressure fluctuate throughout the day, and that actually affects how much oxygen is in the air, affecting, you know, what we want in racing is good combustion. So in addition, weather values affect the amount of fuel vaporization as well so what, what do we look at here so high ambient temperatures and or low barometric pressures will reduce available horsepower while low ambient temperatures and or high barometric pressure will increase available horsepower so we know that when you're trying to ignite something we wanted to have it colder right and less barometric high barometric pressure so the lower the pressure and the higher the temperature the less we could burn the fuel so we weren't able to get the the quick passes off we had to we, what you would have to do is change the jet sizes the amount of fuel that's being sprayed you gotta add more fuel when you have lower pressures or yes lo, more fuel for low high pressure less fuel more horsepower i just wanted to point that out absolutely so they didn't give us a whole bunch of information under atmospheric pressure, but uh, this cabin pressure did get my attention because we're talking about aircraft and how high they can go. So let's take a look at cabin pressurization. And um, this right here is where we're gonna start seeing the limits of what we can do engineering wise. So cabin pressure is a process in which conditioned air is pumped into the cabin of an aircraft or spacecraft in order to create a safe and comfortable environment for passengers and crew flying at high altitudes. For aircraft, this air is usually bled off from the gas turbine engines at the compressor stage for the aircraft, and it's carried in high pressure, often cryogenic tanks. The air is cooled, humidified, and mixed with recirculated air if necessary before it is distributed to the cabin by one or more environmental control systems. The cabin pressure is regulated by the outflow valve. Uh, while the first experimental pressurization system saw use during the 1920s and 30s, it wasn't until 1940 that a commercial aircraft would enter service with a pressurized cabin. That was the Boeing 307 straddle liner. Um, this practice would become widespread a decade later. So we're talking about the 1950s when pressurized cabin uh, came into play. Um, they had some failures and what they, what they learned about was metal fatigue and how the aircraft skin stresses. And so they had some failures, but they learned from it and their engineering improved. Uh, the supersonic airliner Concorde, all right, this, this one right here, it's not in service anymore, but they say that it, it could fly up to 60,000 feet. Now this is this is where a lot of the spy planes are at as far as their listings are concerned. And um, so while maintaining a cabin altitude of 6,000 feet, this is exceptional because most of our airplanes right now maintain a cabin altitude of 8,000 feet. Um, this not only increased airframe weight, but also saw the use of smaller cabin windows than most other commercial passenger aircraft. Uh, intended to slow the decompression rate if a depressurization event occurred. 
So let's take a look at the need for cabin pressurization. Pressurization becomes increasingly necessary at altitudes above 10,000 feet above sea level to protect crew and passengers from the risk of a number of physiological problems caused by the low outside air pressure above that altitude. For private aircraft operating in the U.S., crew members are required to use oxygen masks if the cabin altitude stays above 12,500 feet for more than 30 minutes, or the cabin altitude reaches 14,000 feet at any time. At altitudes above 15,000 feet, passengers are required to be provided oxygen masks as well. On commercial aircraft, the cabin altitude must be maintained at 8,000 feet or less. Pressurization of the cargo hold is also required to prevent damage to pressure-sensitive goods that might leak, expand, burst, or be crushed on repressurization. So this right here, if, if they didn't pressurize the cargo hold on an airplane, and you took your hairspray and your hair gel and all these different things, they would just it would be all over the place. So I got a huge problem. I got a huge problem. Right? Can you show me the pressure systems in the satellites? <laughs> well, not only that. Well, so that's a schematic that's keeping that satellite from crushing or being ripped to pieces apart. Well, a satellite they're going to say is uh, unmanned, but the ISS, right, is I, 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 is I'm manned. Not talking about a manned I'm not talking anything about man being on it. I'm talking about the actual physics that are keeping the satellite itself from exploding. <laughs> the pressure has to be maintained for it too. Well, no, they don't. Like they, the water bottle. We're now, we're talking about the water bottle again. You saw what happened when you went down in elevation. It crushed. Yeah, they right? just wouldn't pressurize it though. That way it would. But you still would need to anti-pressure it. <laughs> you would need to stop the satellite from exploding. Cause it's going way up in the sky. They they claim they've got these things out. How far are the satellites? Like 20, 22,000 miles for, yeah, for a geo, for a geo stationary. stationary. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. So hypoxia. So the lower pr partial pressure of oxygen at high altitude reduces the oxygen tension in the lungs and subsequently in the brain leading to sluggish thinking, dimmed vision, loss of consciousness, and ultimately death. So mm -hmm. they're saying that this stuff begins at 8,000 feet. So the reason why, <laughs> the reason why you don't have your airplane pilot flying the airplane, you know, at a higher altitude, not being pressurized is because his brain, he's not going to get the air that he needs to be able to uh, fly the plane. So in some, yeah, it, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, the oxygen and everything starts to, uh, because it's lighter than air, it starts to fly upwards in your body, right? So it, it's kind of like anti-bends. Yeah, I think that's coming up. In some individuals, particularly those with heart or lung disease, symptoms may begin as low as 5,000 feet. So that's, that's mile high. That's already going to Denver is a struggle for these people. Although most passengers can tolerate altitudes of 8,000 feet without ill effect, at this altitude, there is about 25% less oxygen than there is at sea level, right? 25% less at 8,000 feet. So notice that there's a line on mountains where the vegetation stops. Now we know the reason why, because there's not enough oxygen up at the higher altitudes for the org organic life to exist. Um, So here's, here's sort of an interesting limit here. Uh, this is because a person who is used to living at sea level needs about 0.2 bar partial oxygen pressure to function normally. And that pressure can be maintained up to about 40,000 feet by increasing the mole fraction of oxygen in the air that is being breathed. At 40,000 feet, the ambient air pressure falls to about 0.2 bar at which maintaining a minimum partial pressure of oxygen of 0.2 bar requires breathing 100% oxygen using an oxygen mask. Can we can we hover over mole fraction for a second, please? I want to, it's to your right, right there. In chemistry, the mole fraction or molar fraction is defined as a unit of the amount of a constituent. 
constituent. Constituent. Divided by the total amount of constituents in a mixture, this expression is not given. What, this is, what is this? Yeah, it's, well, it's, they're talking about. Are just going to give me some math? I thought it was going to explain what they did. Yeah. No, how much oxygen. They're, they're saying that at 40,000 feet, you have to have 100% oxygen in order to get the minimum amount of oxygen that you need. So you just have to increase the amount of oxygen in the air that because you're losing oxygen. So you just 100% now. Yeah, but 40,000 is the max for that. You can't go above that. Um, above that altitude, the partial pressure of oxygen will fall below 0.2 bar even at 100% oxygen. And some degree of cabin pressurization or rapid descent will be essential to avoid the risk of hypoxia. Then you got altitude sickness, decompression sickness, barotrauma. So these are the things like you were talking about, like the bends. Uh, and we have a clip where the guy says that um, without the spacesuit, if, if the cabin depressurized in the YouTube plane, that um, like all the stuff inside the person's body would start boiling right away. That wouldn't be good. So here's another example of the cavern pressure. An empty bottle sealed at 37,000 feet is crushed on descent to sea level compared with the one in the original state. Um, so this 8,000 just keeps on showing up. This is really the limit that our bodies can operate at um, for most people. For most people above 8,000 feet and there's just not enough air anymore. So then we've got spacecraft. Um, what do we want to cover here? So they do say that they maintain sea level pressure in the ISS. And we're going to show people the reason why we know that that's BS. Let's see if there's anything else here. Everybody's seen the mass. This is, if the cabin were to depressurize, the plane was up at 35,000 feet. You would want to put your mask on very quickly because otherwise you're going to pass out. There's not enough oxygen up at 35,000 feet and you'll die of hypoxia, right? If you don't get this mask on and if they don't get down to a lower altitude very quickly. They dive. All right, let's go ahead. I'm in the uh, first hour of the two hour show. Well, we don't have a, a, a time limit. Yeah. But let's keep going. We do have a song break if you need one. Okay, so this amateur rocketry, we looked at high altitude balloons and how high we could go with those. And now where we're going to see our, our ultimate altitude uh, record is in amateur rocketry. And this is going to have to do with the momentum that they can uh, achieve with the amateur rockets. And so, should we take a break and then we'll come back and we'll get into rockets? Sure, sounds great with me. All right.
are back. That was fun. So we're going to get into some amateur rocketry here. And uh, looking forward to sharing some video footage. But first, let's take a look what Wik at Wikipedia has to say about this. They said it became popular in the 50s and 60s. And what we're looking for is the notable events. So 2004, this, this one right here, civilian space exploration. I do believe this is the go fast. So CSXT slash go fast. Most of us have seen this footage already. That's from 2004. And they say they achieved an altitude of 72 miles. Now we're going to see that that is suspect. And um, we're going to look at what the, the real range is as far as how high they've been. Um, here's some of the other ones that they get honorable mention. So 2007. This vehicle set the world record for highest altitude launch by a student team with uh, 200,000 feet. Right now, all of a sudden, we're up at the range of a high altitude balloon. Now, they say that they had a maximum velocity of Mach 4.4. That's fast. That's really fast. Um, this one doesn't have an altitude. This one... 2013 they say uh, there's no altitude here 2015 this dare launched to an altitude of 21.457 kilometers 2016 an altitude of 30 kilometers 2019 this one they say reached an apogee of 339,000 feet. So this right here is, um, looks like it would be the record set setter, right? 339,000 feet. Um, but if you keep reading here, this makes it the highest performing student design and student manufactured rocket in the world. And are the first to reach the internationally accepted definition of space. However, even though all subsystems were reported as performing nominally throughout the flight, the rocket experienced a loss of GPS data from approximately 13 seconds to 278 seconds of flight, therefore missing apogee. So they don't have any information about it. <laughs> they, they say it made it, yeah. Nothing? Well, wow. it... Okay. It didn't have any data from 13 seconds to 278 seconds. Hmm. So the the apogee was just a guess. All right. And then we keep going through here. Guess guess who gets honorable mention? Oh, no. Come on. Rocket Man, Mad Mike Hughes. <laughs> Get out of here right now. This is for real. It is, too. I'll continue. February 2nd. So 222. Two, two. 2020, Mike Hughes, known as Mad Mike, died after the parachute of his homemade rocket deployed prematurely and oh. detached during liftoff. NASA built him that too, right? Don't, <laughs> don't people get that twisted? NASA was the one working with Mad Mike. All right. So you can do your own searching for the the highest altitude rockets. And um, this one right here, the this is the Phoenix 4 Rocket launches to over 200,000 feet, attaining the highest amateur two-stage flight. Now, this was from four years ago, and it says June 16th, 2018, Black Rock Desert, Nevada, accelerating to over 3.5 times the speed of sound. Um, so it said the rocket coasted to 46 miles above sea level. Now, this right here actually looks like real footage. I think that they actually were able to shoot a rocket up to 200,000 feet. Why, why is it so narrow? They get the vertical upright position of the camera though? They it's odd. They give uh, multiple camera views here. Okay. So let's go ahead and check this out. This is pretty cool. How fast does it go? Well, f just wait. <laughs> Five, 
<laughs> Did you see that? So <laughs> fast. <laughs> yeah. So you had the uh, the camera looking down this launch sleeve here. You have a camera that's looking out sideways from the rocket, and you have this side view where you can see down here where it was launched, and it's it's up, up and away. All right. So we've got a timer over here. It's going to give us a little bit of information. It wasn't like the other high altitude balloon where it gave us the temperature and all that kind of stuff, but we are going to get some critical information. And the other thing that I think is going to help people is if you pay attention to the audio in this, it's going to, the audio is important. So let's, let's check this out right away. It's at Mach 2.1. We're five seconds in. Double the speed of sound, five seconds in, and we're already getting a booster burnout. So they had a booster burn for five seconds to get it up to this speed. So now we get a message, sustainer ignition. We've got another engine turning on right now. So you heard it. Listen, we're at 15 seconds. Look at how high we are above the clouds already. We're moving. All right, we're going Mach 3.53 and it says sustainer burnout. We're only less than 30 seconds in, but we are up there already. Oh, it's getting quiet. And that's it. What happened to the sound. That's it. Engine. The sound go. The engine is burned out already. We're 40 seconds in. We're up this high. Okay. And, um, we're probably up into that 60, 70, 80,000 foot range right now, right? Where there's not enough air and the engine's burned out. And what we're going to do is coast all the way up to its apogee, all right? So there's no, no motor anymore. You can hear this thing twisting around a little rattle here, or there. Watch this wobble. Oh, the interesting thing is we can't see, but where is this launched from? Yeah, it's below, straight below here. We should be able to see like so much of the earth, right? It should be curving away. We should be able to see states and country. Well, I don't know where we are. So. Uh, Black Rock Desert, Nevada. Nevada. Okay, well, why aren't we seeing California? Right, the ocean. Is that what we're seeing to the right? I don't know. So we're still coasting up. We're still coasting up, even though the engine's been off for a long time now. Momentum, right? Momentum. Not starting to slow down now. Watch this wobble. Still coasting up. It's acting super strange. Good. Boom. Apogee. 244,186 feet. So that happened at two minutes in, but notice how long it was traveling upward mm -hmm. just because of the momentum that it had. So this is the reason why it was able to get up this high is because of the speed that it was going, but its engine couldn't continue to run and... and how come the how come the engine's not running right now? How come we're not going to the ISS, right? Yes. Continuing to continue to blast up in the sky. They're trying to see how far they could go, right? How high? Yeah, it's because you run out of air at a certain elevation. Therefore you can't combust anything. And and notice, so it's deployed its parachute and it's still gonna be very, very quiet. 
Mm-hmm. Right, there's. It's going to take a floaty. totally floaty. It's going to. Uh, we're going to go from convex to concave. This right here is, you know, proof that this is a fisheye lens. It's concave. It's just starting to free fall now. Now it's all just floating. It's not falling fast either. It's really slowly. Really well, slowly. notice. You don't really have that much greater of a circle of sight. Yeah, notice when you start to hear stuff again. It's going to take a little yeah. while. We, we don't see that much. Why don't we see all of Nevada? Why can't we see all of it? The whole state. We should be able to see Texas here. With 200,000 feet up, we can't see all of Nevada? People need to th think about this in their subconscious mind. So we're... Why can't we see... Yeah, we're in free fall, but you still can't hear anything. The, the parachute's not making any noise yet. That's the whole sphere of Earth right there, right? It's all desert, Nevada. The whole ball of Earth. There's where they launched it from. Oh. Now... You could still, oh, I heard a noise. Oh. Now it's starting to pick up a little bit of wind resistance, and the parachutes are going to start... To in, in, uh, inflate? Yeah. Correct word. Oh, oh, we got a little stabilization. Mach 1.84, that's on the, the downfall with the parachute? Yeah, well, because it's just getting to the point right now where the parachute actually has something to, to grab onto. Ah. See, now, now we start to hear the wind. Yeah, there was no wind up above. It was, it was silent. Absolutely. We got to the top of the simulation, everybody. I hope everybody had their arms up for that ride. That was so much fun. Yeah, so... That was awesome. Yeah, you know, we've got a high-altitude balloon that, you know, gets up into this range. We've got uh, a rocket, but the engine burned out. It couldn't keep running because it ran out of air. And then because of the speed that it had, it got up to this altitude. But this really here is, is the ceiling as far as any sort of lighter than air vehicle or, or, or rocket, you know, an air, else. airplane can't go up this high. There's mm -hmm. the engines can't run. There's no air for the wings to, to flutter off of. No, there's, there's, there's nothing up there. Nothing. It's the edge of the simulation, right? There's no more reality. Everybody come on. It's, it's really simple to understand. Why do you think it's black up there in the daytime? Think about this, everyone. <laughs> it's right. because there's nothing there. It's emptiness. It's a void. Okay. It's the edge of, we're looking at the wall of the simulation. We're looking at, we just went to the edge if everyone was paying attention. So let's go ahead and start banging on why, why things like the ISS are absurd. So can an airliner provide ground level cabin protection, uh, pressure, temperature, and humidity? So they say that the ISS is sea level cabin pressure. Can an airliner do it? So if you start reading through here, you know, the questions being asked, apart from the cost angle, which seems to be the biggest factor in airlines, is it technically possible to bring cabin atmosphere pressure to airliners, say at 35,000 feet? The question was asked, and we're going to get down to an answer down here that, um, it's going to really show us the problem. All right. This of course is a big one, but in reality, it's not a big deal. While it may seem a bit irritating, a 8,000 foot atmosphere equivalent is still more than breathable. The FAA does not require continuous O2 until 14,000 feet for unpressurized planes. So for an 8,000 foot equivalent cabin, it's far it's more than fine from a, that standpoint, but weight and strength. So this answer right here really lays it straight. And this is what I was talking about with uh, T jump and his audience couldn't comprehend. I said pressure. This is, this is the problem. So weight and strength at 35,000 feet, the ambient pressure is about 3.6 PSI. Remember we said at sea level, it's 14.7 PSI, all right? Even at 35,000 feet, now we're down at 3.6. So the pressure inside the aircraft is about 11 PSI, assuming an 8,000 foot cabin altitude. Imagine a cabin door approximately two meters by one meter 
or 18 square feet. The force on the door is about 8,750 pounds or 4.3 tons. So that's if you pressurize the inside of the airplane to 11 PSI and you're at, um, you're at 35,000 feet, they already have to deal with this type of force. The door wants to actually pop out the window. 8,750 pounds? Mm -hmm. 4.3 tons? Yeah. You understand so, how, how, how much weight that is, right? Everybody on the other side of the screen, you guys you guys are getting this number like I am. Do you yeah. know how strong a structure would have to be to combat that? It, yeah. You have to... <laughs> so imagine now that the cabin pressure is 14.5 PSI. Now the force on the door is 12,850 pounds or 6.4 tons. Okay, so how we're going to debunk satellites this is... is Basically, what you could understand is that is much heavier than air. We already established from the intro to this hangout, the only way to go high in altitude is to have either something that's lighter than air, right? Which Jason went through with the balloons, and then something that creates thrust with a propeller and uh, wings with, with some kind of force or a turbofan. Now you're telling me that the higher we go up, that the more of this weight it's pressure pressure so the the pressure that's inside the vehicle wants to go to the outside where there's not pressure so the the cabin actually wants to explode explode rip apart so would all other things floating in the in the sky not just that but any satellite any any drone any plane anything that you create and you send up there it has the um anti as if the collapsing in on you going underwater going up everything rips outwards all right, and that's just one door. Now imagine the extra force for all the other doors, the windows, and the fuselage itself. The additional force would be huge. To build a fuselage that strong would be very heavy. The temperature can be controlled no matter what the cabin altitude, and most people can cruise at 8,000 feet with no significant health effects. Therefore, it's just not necessary or cost-effective to build an aircraft strong enough to fly with a cabin altitude of zero. And yet they say that's what the ISS is, right? Nonsense. With, with no structural <laughs> interior cross members, what you would really need is you would need a cage around the entire ISS holding the ISS from exploding outwards. Yeah, with cross members connecting through the cage, almost like when somebody breaks a bone and they hook up the type of apparatus around the outside, that's to keep the bone stabilized. You would need that everywhere. Plus, it would have to defy being able to float. It, the, these steel and stuff is still going to fall down. The rocket that we saw, it didn't stay up there, did it? No, it came back down. Yeah. It came back down, right? Yeah. So Metal doesn't float. It's heavier than air. that saying that they used to say when people actually had logic and brains back in the day? <laughs> what goes up? Must come down. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this chart here. And this shows us the U.S standard atmosphere air properties this is imperial units uh for those that uh, do um celsius and and other things you can look at the other charts but here we relate to fahrenheit and pounds per square inch so this chart starts with a minus 5000 feet all right the only way you would be able to do something like that is with a hole dug um you know the dead sea Dead Sea is, what, 1,100 feet below sea level? So your highest absolute pressure, pounds per square foot, at 5,000 feet would be 17.55 pounds per square inch. Now think about that, everybody. Do you know how big a square inch is? It's one inch by one inch, flat. <laughs> right, so 17 pounds per square inch. So look at every single square inch on your body and understand that there's 17 pounds of pressure. Well, at sea level, there's 14.7. At sea level, there's 14.7 pounds per square inch pressing on you everywhere. Pressing on a can of soda, pressing on, on everything with that type of force. Now, the higher you go, there's going to be less of it. So here we see 15,000 feet. We're at eight pounds per square inch. 30,000 feet, we're at four pounds per square inch. Uh, 
45,000 feet. Now this is really the, the ceiling for most commercial aircraft, even the advanced ones. They'll fly at 45,000 feet. There's only two pounds of pressure outside the plane. You gotta have a well-built plane so it doesn't pop. Now look at your temperatures. We started out at 76.84 and <clears throat> below sea level 60, 60 at sea level. And now when we're up to 40,000 feet, we're at minus 70 degrees. These are some really cold temperatures. And it stays relatively the same between 40, 45, 50, 60,000. And then um, you're going to see here that once you get up to 150,000 feet, there's actually a Goldilocks zone where the temperature came back up for a little bit. right? Between 100,000 feet and 150,000 feet. It went from minus 51 Fahrenheit to 19 Fahrenheit. And then at 200,000 feet, it's going back the other direction again. 250,000 feet, you're at minus 88. But they're showing at 250,000 feet, this isn't miles, this isn't uh, meters, this is feet, there's zero pressure. There's no air. Zero air. At 200,000 feet, there's 0.003. All right, pounds per square inch. This is nothing. The reason why the high altitude balloons are bursting at 100,000 feet is because of this. There's only 0.162 pounds per square, uh, per square inch of pressure. So this right here, if you know and understand this chart, you're going to understand that um, achieving, achieving altitudes up in this range, it's going to have to be something special, like like that rocket we just looked at. It had to have been going really fast to get up that high. Um, just, just to reconfirm here, if you search for the highest service ceiling of a pressurized aircraft, it says the highest commercial airliner ceilings are 45,000 feet. That's it. That's as much as the frames can handle. Except for the Concorde, which is, you know, most likely their modern day spy plane that they allowed, you know, guys like Donald Trump and Jacob Rothschild to race around the realm. And they probably still use it. I don't know. Uh, I know that it made loud noise when it was landing in Toronto. I used to watch. So continue, please. Yeah. So this video right here uh, talks about the top five airplanes as far as their altitudes concerned. And um, so you've got a French plane, 65,616 feet. Uh, you've got the American F-22 with the same same ceiling. Uh, there's a MiG that ceilings at 78,000 feet, which is the same as the Lockheed U-2. And then there's supposedly a MiG that uh, ceilings just a little bit higher. Does it say here? Yeah, 82,000. 82,000. I don't believe this one because if you... We're going to take a look at a video here of the U-2. Yeah. And the U-2 is this crazy glider plane with huge wings, right? Mm -hmm. And this MiG up here just looks like your stubby little fighter jet, right? It doesn't have... The same as the other three on the left. It doesn't have the wingspan. No. Or the dynamics. Well, it does have nice aerodynamics. I'll give it that. But it, it needs a much larger wing because basically it's all lift and momentum because the engines actually have to be shut off at a certain height, right? They just yeah. glide. And then they fall down and they re-engage their engines when the pressure hits and then they glide back up. You know, it's it's too bad we live in such a controlled, uh, you know, a Zazel run realm because there's it's such a small group of people that actually get to fly these YouTube planes. And it's like, a, you know, a secret group inside of a secret group stuff going on. But uh, let's get into it. I think it's a great topic. Yeah, so the, uh, the U-2 spy plane... We actually get some footage of it. Like Ronnie was saying, this is a an elite club. But so this is the. If you look at the video here. It comes from the same General Electric engine. Where is? And get this, you guys. This plane is like sixty-five or something years old. This is still their best that they got. It's all like rusted out. The ones that they're showing. And they they haven't made a better version of this uh, in sixty-five years. Yeah, so the reason why I am skeptical about that MiG being able to fly higher is because this this YouTube plane has these huge glider wings on it. I mean, wing. Let's be specific. I believe that it's structurally one uh, one wing 
you know, and then they've built the aircraft fuselage around the one wing. I don't think it's two wings cantilevering off that fuselage, Jason. I'm just saying, we don't have the schematics of it, but it looks to me like one large wing with a fuselage built around it. So I just wanted to show people, this thing's got um, one one landing gear, the main gear, it's got a tail wheel, and uh, these these are like trike trike supporters that are supporting the wings. Four wheels, yeah, trike... Uh... <laughs> Uh, on takeoff so watch this the, the better question is where's all the spy technology equipment how do they hang the big heavy cameras and and all these things that they're supposedly on these planes where where does that stuff balance yeah where's the where's the camera where's the because you realize this plane is balanced in such a way that if they take those uh, training wheels off the sides of the glider wings the plane just tips over <laughs> it does <laughs> like they have to race when this guy lands I, and i i remembered from studying this a long time ago they have to race up behind him and just as he gets down to the point where he's slow enough they have to jump out of the car with those wheels and then run and put them under because the plane will actually tip over and the wing will break off <laughs> right <laughs> and then they got to redo the wing again break or fix the edge of the wing yeah let's show people what this looks like we're gonna give him a thumbs up salute him chase him so he's got these trike wheels under his wings right now Tra training wheels yeah training wheels training wheels <laughs> As the aircraft takes off pogo <laughs> wheels that support it would be fun these guys have a cool job away. see once okay, once the wings get enough lift then the training wheels fall off it's got this single main landing gear with this one little rear As wheel see so due to the to the lift due to the force against the air it actually gives the wing more support it's lockheed martin actually did an excellent job designing this plane i have to admit it's it's a beautiful thing 65 years old what we're looking at on the screen here is 65 year old technology still going the highest seconds the dragon lady is airborne Look at that yeah. thing go. That's, I uh, wish I could fly in it. Even though I'm afraid of heights, I would still go up in that. I would. Let's get some of the flight out of this. So they talk about their elite club. Oh, the suits. This is important. This is key. Key, key, key. And Tell me where NASA does this. That supplies NASA. <laughs> it's looked after by a large physiological support team. The suit by itself is roughly about $125,000. Um, altogether, a fully dressed pilot is about a quarter of a million dollars. The That's a lot of money for us. So, I mean, now that I said that, I bet you we're going to get flooded with comments with links to NASA's demonstration of these same suits, right? Um, I didn't see these suits on Richard Gabranson's nonsense rocket thing or the other guys. Yeah, right? well, the SpaceX guys, remember, they had their little touch screens and they didn't have suits yeah. like this on. No, we didn't. We didn't see them filling up with air and them stiff. They were like, they were just sitting in the, what was that Virgin Galactic one that they just did, right? With uh, yeah. Shatner. Shatner didn't have a compre this type of a suit on. <laughs> Plus there is no internal uh, structure to hold that capsule. So obviously had, had to have been pressurized if they weren't in wearing these types of suits. There were no cross members holding it from exploding <laughs> exactly and again so we are actually stating here i want to go on the record as stating that these suits are real and if you want to go above 40 45 000 feet you absolutely if you don't have this on you die but you the blood all rushes to your head without oxygen in it it just evaporates out of your blood stream and you just pass out and die like that fast you have to have everything pushing the blood back into your body because it wants to explode out of your body right? yeah watch watch this suit it's serious yeah suit has 12 standard sizes and then it also comes in a 13 size which is like the custom so if a pilot can't fit one of our st standard sizes that we do custom fit the the suit to the pilot and he does have a pressurized cabin but if that pressurization system were to fail this is the only thing that's going to keep that pilot alive if he's at those higher altitudes in the event the pilot were to lose pressurization within the aircraft this is how firm the suit will get and like i said with that webbing material it kind of keeps all right look at this this is the type of pressure this is going to be your 14.7 psi right the 
uh, pilot's arm bent if he were to bend his arm, and then if he were to flex the arm, it keeps it in that flex position. Another life-saving item is the Crazy. pilot's <laughs> <laughs> if helmet. anyone thinks you're going far up into the sky or <laughs> and you're not wearing one of these things, you got to, if you think you're going to escape Earth's realm and you're going to go up to do it, you've got another thing coming. <laughs> Look at what length they have to go just to fly. What did you say? Uh, 65,000 feet tops? Uh, yeah. Yep. You got to have all this just to go there. And you can't go higher because we've seen with the rocket launch that there's nothing there. There's no more air. It can only glide. So again, the plane that we saw, the U-2 plane is a glider. So as it gets up enough momentum, like the rocket had, they can just use the lift to glide up, but then they get to a point where they then, they, all of a sudden they just start falling, right? And then they get to a certain level and these suits actually keep them from exploding. Is that what you're saying? So <laughs> yep. I, I wonder how the interior structure of that um, fuselage is built on the U-2 because it, it needs to be pretty, or. If there's no pressure, if there's like, let's say you what? have a leak with water, if you have a ventilation system in the plane, would that help alleviate the pressure differential? Well, they they did say that with this plane, the, the cabin, the cockpit is pressurized, but if that were to fail without this suit, it would be like instant death. High flight, they pressure test everything one more time before the pilot begins the long process of suiting up. We're in a zone that humans don't survive in. Um, we get up there, we get above Armstrong's line. Above Armstrong's line is where the fluids in your body will actually start to boil off. Um, the fluids in your body will boil off. And that's not ideal. That's not ideal. So no. we have a lot of precautions that we take against that. Um, so that's why we're wearing a full pressure suit. And that's to keep, keep that from happening. So if the cockpit does depressurize, then we keep our body below Armstrong's line and keep us safe. We're getting pumped 100% oxygen into the helmet so we can breathe. But 100%. even then, you still have the physiological factors of sitting in a seat for that amount of time. Your body's so exposed to a higher, you know, a pretty high altitude all day long as well. So it's always kind of good to have the day off after to, to sort of recover. Flying at such high altitude is so... Let's check out some of the footage here. That aren't so aren't so nice. It is a very small group of guys. We like to brag that there's uh, there's more guys wearing Super Bowl rings than there are uh, wearing <laughs> U2 solo patches. So <clears throat> come on, Freemason stick. Exactly how high the U2 flies is top secret. All the U.S. Air Force will say is that it's above 70,000 feet, but the modern U2 jet can cover 7,000 miles without refueling. The thrust is massive down low because you're taking in all that air. And once you get above about 50 or above 60, all of a sudden it just gets quiet and it just, it just kind of dances up there. That experience never gets old. There's never been a time that I've been... So we're getting into that range, remember, where the rocket all of a sudden went silent. This, this thing, because it's got the big wings and it's moving along fast enough, can get up and dance in the, the thinnest of air up in the u2 and not just gone <clears throat> but you have know, to have a space suit oh on my God, yeah a real one that, that actually works this. it's never lost it's not something that loses its shine over time you see the world in such a different it's way it's shine huh? you see it from such a different perspective <laughs> than you've ever seen it before um and that will never get old you think this guy thinks the earth is a sphere so same plane 65 years right Look at <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing same plane everybody some are stationed in South Korea, others in places they don't really talk about. The jets they're flying now and were built in the 1980s. We saw too, pause it. The original so it's, it's a dangerous, what they're doing here by accompanying this plane on its wings. This thing drifts huge. When, when you watch from inside the cockpit as it comes into land, I was shocked at how much drift. I think it would just, I would be losing my mind if, if a vehicle drifted that much when I was trying to turn. So it's pretty dangerous that move right there. This this thing isn't. It's it's better to fly in the higher altitudes. When yeah. you get lower, it, it becomes super drifty. 
close attention to the rules, especially the rules that are written in blood that our comrades learned, unfortunately, long time. Like we know the verbiage that, that's pack. been put into our flight manual yes. because of the accidents that have happened in the past. Uh, yes, accidents do happen. So that's that's really the limit as far as flight altitude is concerned. Um, I'm just going to go through the flight altitude records here on Wikipedia quick. We should get a kick out of this. It's going to start out with some real events and then it's going to get into some fiction. So it begins with balloons. That's where we began was with balloons. Um, the highest... The first flight, 1783, 79 feet, right? Almost 80 feet was the first ascent in a hot air balloon. Uh, 1783, 266 feet in Paris. Uh, 1783, 344 feet. 1783, 3,300 feet. 1783, 8,900 feet. Now notice, now all of a sudden we're getting above that 8,000 foot mark. And let's see what happens here. So, um, made the first flight in a hydrogen balloon to about 610 meters. So now, 1784, we're at 13,123 feet. This is, this is starting to get up in the danger zone. Uh, 1803, 23,900 feet. 1839, 26,000 feet. 1862, 29,500. In a balloon filled with coal gas, Glashier lost consciousness during the ascent due to the low air pressure and cold temperature of 12 degrees Fahrenheit. So, he was out. He went up to 30,000 feet. This is 29,500. This is right at about the, the height of Mount Everest, the tallest mountain on earth. And, um, yeah, he went out. He went out because there's not enough air up there. 1901, 35,000 feet. He went in an open basket with oxygen and steel cylinders. Um, 1927... They did it in a helium balloon. Gray lost consciousness after his oxygen supply ran out and was killed in a crash. So, he went up to 43,000 feet. This is up where those commercial airlines can fly, but this is well above where humans can go without pressure. A pressurized the, suit. Or The next well-known one, we got uh, Picard showing up. Mm -hmm. Breaking through the glass dome nonsense that the Freemasons put out, right? hydrogen balloon <clears throat> and so now we're getting up into la la land they're saying 1933 61,000 feet uh, 1934 72,000 feet they said they were killed when the balloon broke up during the descent uh, 35 72,000 feet so they ascended in the explorer 2 gondola from the straddle bowl. So they're talking about gondolas like this being lifted up. So this is like a pressurized vessel like you would see um, descending down into the ocean, right? Very similar, yes. Takes a lot of a lot of structural steel in order to uh, support the, the pressure differential. Um so, look at this. 1957. They're saying 96,000 feet. Some guy went up in this gondola. I want to bring this gondola up. <laughs> All right. You think you would get in this thing and go to 97,000 feet? I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to do that. I mean, it, <clears throat> it seems like it's got quite the structure to it. It's. It's got some, some structure. Um, 102,000 feet. Keep in mind, all these are high altitude balloons. Right? Yeah. None of these are rocket propelled. All right. And so we're, 
now all of a sudden 1960s so these things were supposed to be testing so that uh, astronauts could go to space all right <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> they they had never been to they had this is the highest that they had ever been 123,000 feet. They don't know what's beyond 123,000 feet, right? Uh, you can't go beyond it. And then Felix Baumgartner shows up again. Yeah, so <laughs> these things these things are make believe. The, this is the range that we can get to with a high altitude balloon. A rocket can be shot up that far but humans humans cannot go into that that range um i really wish we had another song we're gonna have to prepare for an extra song break from now on moving forward but we're getting used to the new setups hope everybody's enjoying and hopefully everybody's learning something with us today i learned how to how to read and spell uh constituents yep <laughs> I spelled it right, though. I was thankful. So let's continue on. Now we got Project Stratolab. Yeah, so this was 1950s. This was NASA's work to prepare for for going to the moon, right? And so these two guys are supposed to sit in this uh, this box here, and this is supposed to be lifted up in there. This is Stratolab. <laughs> it's hilarious, some of the stuff they do. Skylab, right? <laughs> yeah. That one. Yeah, that's and that's it. So the um the altitude that they can reach what that we've been able to see is is the mid two hundreds with two hundred thousand feet with a high altitude balloons and with rocket launches. And we saw that the engine burned out on the rocket even well before it got up to that the elevation it couldn't burn anymore the engine was out all it was doing was coasting upwards because of its momentum then it uh, apogeed out and started falling back down so metal is heavier than air and it's always going to fall metal never gets to a certain point and starts to float you either have you know the rocket thrust holding it up you have uh, fans, propellers holding it up, um, or it's got, it's lighter than air. It's filled with hydrogen or helium, but that's it. That's the only way those things can stay up in the air. So I believe that the answer to what our satellites is knowing what they're not and what they can't do, knowing what the limits are. So when people want to know, well, how does SpaceX or, you know, how do they provide satellite internet how is their satellite internet well we were showing with high altitude balloons that they can actually geostationary position these balloons at 60 70 thousand feet and they work as great re relay centers so that that is feasible and we wouldn't see it uh, at that altitude it's just too small for us to see and um I think it's just pure, pure nonsense for a person to believe that metal is going to get up to a certain point where it's just going to float and not come back down. Yeah, that's exactly what you've shown the evidence for. And the only way to get up there seems to be with what you had suggested, um, glider type systems or uh, devices lighter than air. Um, I was going to send you, if, if before we go into the memes... You could um, throw the thumbnail on and then play a song. I'm going to send you on the, the Zoom link. We could still have another song break when you can finish with this section of the podcast. Well, I, I'm pretty much done. I'm... <clears throat> we do have an out song. We're not, we're still going to do the meme section still. Oh, I forgot. I'm sorry. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if, if you want, you could throw it on the thumbnail and then you could just play this off of the YouTube link. And uh, we could have a song break here, and then we'll come back and do the satellites to finish it off. All righty.
just under the moon You need someone that suits you better What makes you think that can't be you? So take me to your best friend's house Tongue tied looking at your mouth We should be asleep by now back great so oh, my it's, okay. it's okay you got it on autoplay we gotta stop that it's <clears throat> a great song too by nightly 20 something if <laughs> that's one i used to play a long time ago um back to the meet me memes about satellite section of the podcast so take it away yeah yeah you provided the memes and uh so we just wanted to do something you know satellite centric where this, this is a big hang up for a lot of people where they, they ask themselves, well, what, what is direct TV? What is, um, you know, the Tesla's satellite internet? What is exceed internet? Um, how are they doing this? So they tell us that they are these floating pieces of metal that, um, are generally up anywhere from 250 miles to 22,000 miles away from earth. And, um, so you got some great memes here. Memes are powerful, powerful tools. And so has anybody ever found a real photo of a satellite in space? Have you ever looked? Have you ever tried to find one? This is, I've tried to find one. This is what you're going to see, right? Yeah, exactly what you have on the screen here. (laughs) <laughs> and it's always it's always a picture outside of the satellite looking at the satellite so there's chase cam chase cam following it <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is a good one so if you actually do the research and you actually go and search up satellite in space on google or whatever browser you're going to use this is what you're going to find okay so if you believe that satellites are real the first thing you need to understand is it's the exact same thing as the sphere earth nonsense is all you get is cartoons Absolutely. Next one, artist impression of GPS satellite, photos of GPS satellites. 
So we're actually starting to get some truth into, into the mix here now. What we're looking at is devices on the ground that send the transmitted single signals throughout the realm. And they have a line of sight, right? That's why we want to get them as high as we can. And they can only see so far too, right? Just like all other things in this realm. Well, that's the reason why they said it would be a great idea to to put this kind of stuff up on a high altitude balloon because it has a larger circle of sight, right? Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> That's what they did. Let's keep it going. We're just going to bust through these. This is just a fun end. Continue with this one. They do not point to space. They point to the nearest communication tower. So Satellites. Satellites. Man, these dishes. I, back in the day, I've installed a whole bunch of this kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, you, you can see that at the equator where they say that the geostationary satellites are above the equator to uh, 22,000 miles out. Yeah. What you won't see is the dishes pointed straight up, <laughs> right? No. And <clears throat> the fact that they called them satellite dishes, they actually told you the truth. Here is your satellite. You're looking <laughs> It's a satellite dish, right? It sends a transmitted a single a signal. Yep. Transmits. Radio uh, signals. See this next one. What do we got on the next on the memes of the, the podcast section here? Pay attention, it says. Okay. What are we looking at? The camera view. <laughs> Wait a minute. So we've got a chase cam following the ISS now, right? And if you were to believe that, what would happen if the camera actually flew towards the ISS and hit some one of the canisters that isn't being supported by anything? What do you think would happen if this was real? <laughs> It would destroy it, right? But continue on. Nothing's up there. This is CGI. I'm surprised they didn't put a shadow on the Earth of the ISS in this shot. But there has been a big push on the ISS again lately where you've got um, uh, B, what's her name? You've got Jaren. You've got Karen B. Karen B. They're, they're all saying that you can actually go out and film and record the ISS transiting the moon or the sun at the same day, at the same time that, um, Red's rhetoric is back on this tip. So, yeah, um, Jaron beat Red's with proof of the uh, ISS transiting <laughs> the moon or the sun or something like that, right? Probably. He beat Red's. <clears throat> Satellites don't exist. And, um two things come to mind. Why can't a single one of these satellites, about 17,000 of them, take a real picture of Earth? Right? All these satellites, not a single one's taken a picture of Earth. And why can't NASA show us a real photo of a satellite? Not even at their own homepage in the description of a satellite. Well, ask yourselves these questions. Why can't they do it? Why erect 1,500 foot antennas if satellites exist? All right, 17,000 of them, they say. What's the point of doing this? So if they had satellites, they wouldn't have to have the towers. If we had stuff floating around in the sky, and it's funny because big Elon, Elon old Musk gets to be the hero, right? Giving everybody this, oh, you can hook up to the internet. You just need to point this dish in this direction. Elon saying that he's got these things floating up in the sky. And as soon as you point your dish in this direction, you have pretty fast internet, right? Right? Yet they went around and erected towers everywhere, 5G towers and all these other towers too. And we had the same amount of internet then. And people still think that there's stuff floating in the sky. Now, you know, one caveat to this is that if you put on night vision goggles, I, I have to do this myself, but I've seen video of it. I don't know if the video is real. But supposedly you can see lots of stuff moving around. Now, if you do are if you are a sky watcher like me, you will constantly see like looking like stars just floating through the sky, right? You, mm -hmm. you see lots of this. If you actually just lie outside and pay attention to the sky, you'll see these things and people say, oh, those are satellites, right? That's what we were told. We're told they're satellites, but uh, <clears throat> I have I have a bunch of different other theories. They could be multiple different things, but it's if they if they had satellites in space they wouldn't need these towers on the ground it's just a simple meme explaining that all right so they say that all these services are coming from satellites you know all the things like um gps and um 
Let's... This one's sort of funny. Who took the picture of the, the satellite? Both of us looked at this and we saw the same thing right away. Yeah. They made this thing out of a, uh, a PEX fitting. Right? So yeah. anybody that's done some plumbing and knows what PEX is probably sees this as being a female copper to PEX adapter. Just like this. Yeah. We're giving you a cross section of the diagram of what we, they've wrapped tin foil around or something. <laughs> they've taken a picture of it and then they've CGI'd it. And look, where's the dish pointing to? I don't even know the thing. What is that? Toilet seat lid? A toilet seat lid. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. It, that is hilarious. This is Hubble. This is supposedly what takes pictures of the outer reaches of the universe, right? When you can only see inside your circle of sight, it doesn't matter how big, how far, or where you are. But not Earth. And we, and we did see that when you go up in these super high altitude planes, that when you look down at the ground, it's nothing but clouds, and you can't even really see the ground. No. Can't make anything out. But continue. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Got sticky tape tinfoil and paper mache so you had said that you don't think this is the actual so they've people have made false false memes and diagrams and pictures of, of another lunar lander right yeah this isn't nasa's version but uh nasa's doesn't doesn't look much better than this if you actually look at it yeah we got like a a, a boat top cover from a <laughs> pontoon boat on the left side here we've got uh what looks like maybe <laughs> parts from a tent on the top and then we've got a tarp hanging down so if you know if, then they've got like uh, gold uh, aluminum gold foil wrapped around whatever other nonsense we see but this isn't far off and then what is that other stuff is that supposed to be like banged out tin that they've riveted together somehow in the center sections i, I really the lunar lander is just as crazy nonsense as this as well one well, remember the whole pressure thing that if you're going to maintain pressure in here, <laughs> that, does that thing look like it could hold pressure? The hatch hatch door is going to have to hold like 8,000 pounds of, of force. Square inch? Yeah, no, over the whole door, but. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, proofs of the globe. One, NASA images. It's Photoshop, but it has to be. Two, public indoctrination. We know because the scientists said so. And three, popular opinion, because everyone else believes it, so it must be true. And so this is exactly how they do all their indoctrination. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's through these three things. So the only reason why anybody ever believed in heliocentrism was because NASA gave them a, the blue marble picture, which was fake, right? And then two, everybody uh, went to school and they said, this is true. The people at school told everybody that, and then they went to a better school, and that school said, well, we're going to give you a degree. Then he went around saying, I got a degree that says that this is true. And then the third one, well, everybody believes it, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are the actual basic levels of mind control and how um, propaganda is spread through the population. All right. The critical communication link. So you'll see some memes where they talk about uh, the dangers of having ships and subs um because they can actually interfere with the undersea cables right the undersea cables is how we communicate um so this one says inside a typical undersea cable uh, 1.2 inches this isn't even a big cable but yet with fiber optics you can get a lot of data through something like that so it says more than 95 percent of world communications rely on undersea cables it can be accidentally or deliberately cut how come they wouldn't use uh satellites if they had satellites right and also the direction of the running of the cables it's uh, interesting how they connect can you go back to that yep sorry you jumped the gun i just want people to understand the way that we explain reality is that it has four corners and then our realm our map of this game that you're in basically looks like this. And we can see the cables actually go from the Pacific right to the Pacific, right? You can see how they connect because we constantly get people that come on to our podcasts or on Jason's videos. And we're going to be probably hearing it next week too on Friday when we do the conversation with T-Jump and his heliocentric friend is that, well, how do you get to one part of the realm on your map to the other? Well, I mean, it, does it have to have an explanation on this no satellites showing you the underwater cable do people are they able to draw the correlation between the cables going from one side of the map to the other mm. 
I just want to point that out for everybody that's skeptical of the things that we talk about. It's so ambiguous that they didn't even need to put a little key legend on the bottom explaining, well, they just yeah. connect, they wrap to the other you side. Go from here to here. <laughs> I just wanted to point that out. And yes, they actually have cables, right? And if, if the earth was a pizza, pressurized pizza dome map, like the AE map and model, do you know how much longer it would be to run the cables around a 60,000 mile ice wall? compared to 24,000 miles wide like this map here. This map isn't right, but it's it's close. They don't even have Antarctica on here and a bunch of other things are skewed in the north. But I just wanted to point out those things. Yeah, this looks like a Gall Peters to me. Yeah. Uh, skewed so that the people in those land masses think they have more money, more land, <laughs> more money, more power. That's why they skew the different maps, right? Because they want to project. That's it. Continue. Yeah, this is basically the same thing. Uh, 90, 95% of all data, internet calls, etc., run through cables under the sea. Cables. Cables. Not satellites, people. I'm sorry you were lied to, okay? It's time to let go, and it's time to come out to the truth. We can't go past 100,000 feet. Everything explodes. Humans just can't do it. Even the people in the YouTube videos said humans are not built to go there. We die, right? Get over it. You're not going to Mars. Sorry, there's there's nothing there. You're at the edge of the realm. And people are constantly asking, show me the edge of the realm, Flat Earther. Well, <laughs> I hope you were paying attention when Jason just showed everybody the edge of the motherfucking realm. <laughs> and you know, it gets me so pissed off because we get 20 people watching, right? And we're explaining and showing the edges of the realm, things that are true and false, and then actually you can go out and verify and test for yourself, right? Yet we get nobody sharing it nobody really comments and i mean jason i just want to say you did a great job tonight anybody if you don't if you think that satellites are real and that you can fly up past a hundred thousand feet you didn't pay attention to one thing that we've been showing tonight and, and yeah i get a little bit uh righteous indignation because there should be a hundred thousand people here joining us learning this simple simple truths it's undeniable so, you know, 95% of all of the information that we share throughout the realm, if you're listening to us and you're not in North America, our, vo our voices are traveling through this cable at light speed. You, you, you have no idea the amazing, amazing things that take place in this realm because they've dumbed everybody so down, right? And I mean, wow, Jason, what a great job. If, if people even can grasp that idea that how fast my voice is traveling, if you're in Estonia, if you're in Africa, if you're tuning in from England, if you're in the UK, you are hearing me in real time and my voice is traveling through that cable. Well, actually it's not. All it does is creates a portal where it, it basically, you know, it's entangled, right? And one side, as soon as they have that signal, it just, you can hear me. <laughs> There are so many interesting things and yeah, but they want us to believe they're floating metal things up in the sky. It's it's just nonsense when the true magic of the realm is happening through those cables. You said they can put a lot of information through it, right? So why aren't we investing more into this and looking more about how do we make these even better and faster and more reliable? That's that's what I want to know. Yeah, millisecond latency. It's it's pretty incredible. Um so this is this is a depiction of the heliocentric nonsense so here's a globe earth with the sun 93 million miles away and they want us to believe that this is what it looks like up and above earth Seventeen thousand of these things just floating metal floating metal floating metal all over the place again what did i say the oldest saying is what goes up must come down yet these clown shoes have come out here with cartoons and they fooled they fooled eight billion people almost yeah i'm a little bit fired up because this is true it's so simple if you don't if you don't realize the power of knowing your actual worldview how much that impacts your subconscious mind what they've done to these people the grand delusion we are talking about here this is not a small topic especially when Jason's showing through different ways that we can rate and judge and, and calculate and test pressure, we actually find the edges of the realm, right? This is the, the this is what the heliocentric Kabbalist, uh, what do they call Pythagoreans brought <laughs> to you? Yep. Cartoons of floating metal that defies every test, every verifiable observation we've ever made of anything we've ever shot something up in the sky. And I myself have a experience with shooting rockets. I, um, 
I had a rocket kit. I built the rockets and fired them. And I'll tell you, I lost every single one. They were <laughs> gone. They were gone. I didn't save any. I don't, they were, they just floated away. So kudos to the people that have been able to shoot them up and save them. But like, come on, let's move on to the next one. I'm just fired up because I, where is everybody? Look at this. This is what people believe. This is how far gone their brains are. You know, if you think that you live in a realm and you're being circled by all these things and that's how you're talking to other people, you, you really need to come out of, out of that. You know, it, it's interesting. This actually has a yin yang symbol on it. Doesn't it? <laughs> way that they have it positioned but i just wanted to let people know that this is just absolute nonsense it would be cooler if they put those all the stars and then they showed us the actual heights like within miles to you 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 guys realize that the stars are not beyond your circle of sight any of the luminaries in the sky are actually super close to you but go ahead jay yeah this this is what they want you to believe in uh, this is a crashed USA satellite. This is an industrial concrete mixer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Jason, come on. Okay. Explain to everybody your experience with one of these mixers. Oh, I, I grew up in concrete. So yeah, this is a uh, old cement barrel right here. You can see the dings in the side the of it right here. From the rocks from being inside <laughs> it, being swirled around mixing, right? They painted NASA on the side of it and said it was a satellite. <laughs> that is hilarious. Uh, there we go. This, this is 1915. 1915. Come on, that's yeah. How how high were they in 1915? You we read it. Was it Picard? No, he was in 30 something. Picard. They were so in the 1915 Arlington, Virginia radio transmission from Paris and Hawaii, right, to the United States to the East Coast in 1915. I want you guys to think about that. Were no satellites? satellites. No satellites. No satellites. And, and again. We are going to cover this topic more too, because there's stuff like the dew line, the Laurent system, how things are bounced off of our, our, our circle. Cause it was funny in your conversation with T jump, he brought up that he was able to ping some kind of a photon off of the moon. And I can't wait if we're <laughs> going to talk about that again on Friday, and we're going to talk about how he is somehow able to get through everything else. Everyone in the realm has to bounce their signals off of, and then you actually tune your dish to where the bounce is coming to you. Everything is like a ricochet bounce shot. So if you think you can, if you actually measure something that pings off the moon, you're actually measuring how really local, how so mm. close. If you're telling me, if, how do they even measure a photon? Yeah, they, do they don't. They don't. No it's make believe. Time. Yeah, it's all nonsense. Okay, let's just keep going. I'm ranting, <laughs> but that's fine. I'm trying to get this place pumped up a bit. This is what we do here. It's not just we come with the truth. Look at this. You want to believe a lie? Okay, the top one is what you've been told a satellite is and your realm, and the bottom one is what it is. It's flat. You're at the edge of it here with that blackness. There is nothing there, ladies and gentlemen. There is nothing there. We have found the edge all you ball earthers that come around oh if the earth is flat show me there's the fucking edge okay open your eyes we are seeing the edge of reality and it, you well know see jason who is the largest purchaser oh. of things that are lighter than air nasa, NASA. biggest wait, wait, let me get the bell out <laughs> it's been so long since i had the bell here we go there's the bell ringer. Ding. NASA is the largest purchaser of things that Jason said in the description box when we started this off. What goes up? Things that are lighter than air. That satellite is not lighter than air. You'd have to be mm -hmm. retarded to think that it was lighter than air. No, it's a chunk of metal. Chunk of metal. Metal's heavier than air. And then the last one, fake satellites in space and real saddleloons on Earth. <laughs> Balloons. Now you started it with balloons and lo and behold, mm -hmm. we are finishing it off with balloons too. Yeah, notice these, they don't fill them all the way up. They just get enough in here in order to have the lift to get off the ground because as this ascends, the lack of pressure is going to make it expand and expand and expand. So I'm they can, they can I'm, control it. I'm sure they can control tune it. it. They can tune it so that yes. it doesn't keep ascending to the point that it's going to burst. Yep. And then what they do is when it starts to fall, they send up a reconnaissance or a, a, a recover plane, and they actually have a giant hook that they drag out and they actually retrieve these things. Like I said, this is just part one. There's so much more involved with this whole hoax. We'll do another one. We're going to continue to keep going. This is just the start to it, right? And uh, 
this is a great way to finish. <laughs> There's your satellite <laughs> balloon. And the one on the top is a cartoon. Okay? That's it. Well, it's been great, brother. Yeah, this is... um. This is something that we may end up taking clips of it. I may put it into a video. Uh, I think that understanding, knowing what pressure is and how it affects things uh, really allows us to preclude the whole idea, the whole notion of satellites existing. And um, then we can look at what, what's really taking place. So it really does look like balloons are being used um, for our communication systems that they they're doing geo stationary where it goes up there's no more air movement it just sits there and they say that they park it right over a, a place where they transmit with a laser up to it so no i don't know about all this we're gonna have well, to look deeper into this topic <laughs> yeah that might not work um i don't know if it's true could but i mean we can look deeper into the topic it could be like millimeter wave uh technology uh highly well, they, High strength radio waves. Well, we didn't go into it, but they show us pictures of um, uh, blimps and they're tethered. They're tethered to the earth, right? I mean, there's so much more of this hoax. Uh, you know, I just want to read the description again. It says there are two ways we can sustain travel up in the air. One, fans and propellers that create thrust in the air can ascend vertically and when used with wings can keep themselves afloat using lift off of the air pressure until they get where, Jason? You said about 100,000 feet. Well... No, that sort of that that sixty to eighty thousand range seems to be the limit for limit. for that type of airplane propeller, fan, um, all that kind of stuff seems to really top out at uh, the sixty to eighty thousand range. And and this is also the reason why. Well, I don't even want to say that because I don't even know if those rocket launches are not just smoke and mirror shows with with mm. actual like modern day magic so two lighter than air vehicles that use either helium or hydrogen which nasa is the largest purchaser of those two right to lift up their payload both of these have their limitations and those limitations preclude the possibility of quote satellites even existing could you comment on that yeah well that's been the focus of tonight um if, if you have a pressurized vessel, such as the ISS, they say, you're, you're dealing with tons and tons and tons of force because of the lack of pressure outside of it. And they're saying that they've pressurized it to 14.7 pounds per square inch on the inside. So um, nonsense, nonsense. And all the other things, like a, a satellite where it wouldn't be pressurized inside the vehicle... Uh, we saw that rocket launch where the engine cut out at a certain elevation because there's no more oxygen. So it ran out of momentum, it apogeed out, and then it fell back to earth. Remember, metal is heavier than air and it doesn't float. All right, so you can shoot it up real fast and it can get to its highest peak and then it comes back down. And so that right there excludes, precludes, satellites from existing yeah there's no way around it you've absolutely destroyed any notion or theory that a satellite could exist F furthermore you've shown the actual repeatable measurable evidence that if it's not lighter than air it's going to fall back down right mm -hmm. and to finish it off pressure is a real measurable force and flying vehicles must be built to withstand the pressure changes it will experience during a flight at different altitudes. In this hangout, we did, we have gone through, and I hope everybody understands what pressure is and how it precludes the existence, we'll say it again, of satellites. Oh, it's been great, brother. Great. Um, so our next hangout will be Friday at noon, where we're talking with T-Jump and well, I'll Mr. Sensible. Friday morning. Friday morning. No. At 6 a.m. Central on the rj shine channel and then we'll be live at 12 mm -hmm. p.m central correct yeah and i'll um, i'll get a thumbnail out yeah it looks like we'll probably be on awake souls great i think that's the best place for it i'm looking forward to that it's going to be so much fun right yeah and this was great too uh do you have any last words brother 
No, thank you very much to everybody that tuned in and uh, everybody in the future. If you have any comments, please leave them below. We, we like to explain things and go into further detail in the comment section below. That gives us the opportunity to really pay attention to anybody's questions. And uh, yeah, um, thank you very much. And I hope everybody has a great rest of the night. Last words, brother. Only beyond flat earth. We fell out of sync, out of time. Been like that for a while Meters turn into miles And all the fun we had before A distant thought behind closed doors I think that we're beyond repair See my despair So I'm pushing away I keep pushing away Gravity is pulling me closer Closer into your space But we don't resonate We're not on the same page We were trying to get Just